First published in 1949, Aldo Leopold's A Sand County Almanac is now an established environmental classic, beginning with a beautifully written description of the seasonal changes in nature and their effect on the delicate ecological balance. The book proceeds to examples of man's destructive interference and concludes with a plea for a wilderness aesthetic that is even more urgent and timely today than ever before. That's the summary readers are greeted with in the 1970 edition of A Sand County Almanac with essays on conservation from Round River by Aldo Leopold, which is a little depressing given that this is written in 1948 and we are still experiencing today man's destructive interference. And that is stemming from 1948. They said it's even more pressing now in 1970. And I'd argue that today in 2023, it is even more of an issue. Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here. Hi, I'm Devin. We're talking about a book today. This one. This one. This year, I really wanted to read more for a couple different reasons. Um, one, I really want to write a book. <laughs> and um, to be able to effectively write, I feel like you need to know what it's like to read good books or really bad books. I just need to read a lot. And I hope to make some videos about the stuff that I read. Um, but also, when I was in college, I bought a bunch of books for classes that I didn't e uh, end up finishing. So this is going to be a series of videos where I read books that I bought for college that I didn't finish reading, and now I can actually learn whatever the professors wanted me to learn from these books. Figured I'd get something out of the thousands of dollars of debt that I'm in. In my first year of college, I had a class on the conservation of the environment with a great professor. Really enjoyed the class, really enjoyed the, the material. We read this book, parts of it. Only some of the essays were actually assigned to us. And for the first like half of the course, I was really on top of reading. And then I got sick and there were some other things that came up and I started having to use Sparks Notes to catch up on some of the reading to get the, the summaries of the chapters. And that was heartbreaking. I was really liking the book. I had this pattern from previous years of school and high school and middle school where I didn't finish the books that I really enjoyed for classes I really enjoyed. I was felt really guilty about using Sparks Notes or any other like external ways of gaining the summarized knowledge of the book. So this time around, I'm reading the whole thing. Not just the chapters that were assigned in the class, I'm reading the whole thing. And that's not because I couldn't find the syllabus for the class. That's not the reason. I'm reading the whole thing on purpose. Because I chose to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of funny to me how many places in the book that they tell you what you're about to read. Um, there's the, the summary that I sh that I already read to you. There's a blurb on the back with a line that talks about the unspoiled American landscape, which kind of grosses me out. And there's also a preface to the enlarged edition. And also there's the foreword to Sand County Almanac. So that's a lot. <laughs> I'm actually going to go over some of the things that are in both the preface and in the foreword. But today we're going to skip most of the preface they change the formatting that's what part of the preface is about there's also interesting things in there about like other environmental causes that were prevalent in 1966 when they got the copyright for this before it was printed in 1970 so i would like to do some research into some of those other things that are talked about in the preface before making the next video but i'm kind of on a time crunch <laughs> a bit so i'd like to get this video out tomorrow <laughs> which is wild yeah extremely wild um that did not come out tomorrow it is february 20th and i started filming that on january 30th so not tomorrow and um i can't do any additional research at this juncture because i'm just out of time could have done the research had all the time in the world um didn't do it it'll be in the next video <laughs> so we're skipping the preface for now we're going to read the forward there is one thing about the preface i need to tell you they talk about how they've edited some of the language in the book because it was dated and they didn't want to distract the readers. And if the language in this book is edited to not be dated, oh boy. I wonder what the initial release was like. There is a slur at least once in this book. I'm not going to read it, of course, but yeah. Just be aware of that if you decide to pick up a copy of this. There is a slur against Asian Americans, specifically of Chinese and Chinese Americans, but was just used kind of carte blanche that's in this book and it was derogatory obviously at the time as well so hmm, i don't know why it wasn't omitted in the 1970 release it's not in this chapter it'll be in a later one uh so we don't have to worry about that today but i will get into the history of that word later because i think it's important to talk about prejudice when it comes up so just bear that in mind if you're going to pick up a copy of this book there's going to be nuggets of truth and nuggets of wisdom within this book uh but also you know 
he's a flawed author. That's all I wanted to say. So this is the forward to Sand County Almanac. There are some who can live without wild things, and some who cannot. These essays are the delights and dilemmas of one who cannot. Like winds and sunsets, wild things were taken for granted until progress began to do away with them. Now we face the question whether a still higher standard of living is worth its cost in things natural, wild, and free. For us of the minority, the opportunity to see geese is more important than television, and the chance to find a pasque flower is a right as inalienable as free speech. These wild things, I admit, had little human value until mechanization assured us of a good breakfast, and until science disclosed the drama of where they come from and how they live. The whole conflict thus boils down to a question of degree. We of the minority see a law of diminishing returns in progress. Our opponents do not. So already, there are some things that I really agree with. How a st higher standard of living, is that worth destroying the planet? And no, I don't think it is. There is sort of this idea of wild things not having human value until you have the absence of them, then so thus giving them value. I kind of disagree with that idea, kind of carte blanche. The idea of the absence of something or the presence of its opposite makes you appreciate the thing more. I disagree. In some cases, it can be that way, I'll admit, but I don't think humanity cared less about the world and about the environment until we had mechanization. I think certain sects of people have never cared about the environment, while other sects of people have and have always been stewards of the land and were able to live within the confines of what is readily available, what is within their means. And it is just due to mechanization that other people have started to become more apathetic. I, I think that mechanization has actually led for more human apathy, not less. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of Eurocentric, more of a colonialist, um, a white <laughs> mindset uh, to say, these were things that people didn't care about until mechanization. But, I mean, he kind of talks about that later, but that's that's my two cents. One must make shift with things as they are. These essays are my shifts. They are grouped into three parts. These three parts are a little bit different from how they're actually grouped. Part one tells what my family sees and does at its weekend refuge from too much modernity. The shack. On the sand farm in Wisconsin, first worn out and then abandoned by our bigger and better society, we try to rebuild, with shovel and axe, what we are losing elsewhere. It is here that we seek, and still find, our meat from God. These shack sketches are arranged seasonally as a Sand County Almanac. Part 2, Sketches Here and There, renamed for this edition, recounts some of the episodes in my life that taught me, gradually and sometimes painfully, that the company is out of step. These episodes, scattered over the continent and through 40 years of time, present a fair sample of the issues that bear the collective label, Conservation. Part 3, The Upshot, this is now Part 4, sets forth, in more logical terms, some of the ideas whereby we dissenters rationalize our dissent. Only the very sympathetic readers will wish to wrestle with the philosophical questions of part three. I suppose it may be said that these essays tell the company how it may get back in step. Conservation is getting nowhere because it is incompatible with our Abrahamic concept of land. We abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. This 100% I agree with. This is more in line with uh, my feelings as well in terms of like, yeah, we're not separate from the land. We have to see ourselves as part of a community with the land, with life outside of human society. Humanity is not separate from nature. We are part of nature. So I, th I think, yeah, he's on it there. There is no other way for land to survive the impact of mechanized man nor for us to reap from it the aesthetic harvest it is capable, under science, of contributing to culture. That land is a community is the basic concept of ecology, but that land is to be loved and respected is an extension of ethics. That land yields a cultural harvest is a fact long known, but laterally often forgotten. These essays attempt to weld these three concepts. Such a view of land and people is, of course, subject to the blurs and distortions of personal experience and personal bias. But wherever the truth may lie, this much is crystal clear. Our bigger and better society is now like a hypochondriac, so obsessed with its own economic health as to have lost the capacity to remain healthy. The whole world is so greedy for more bathtubs that it has lost the stability necessary to build them or even to turn off the tap. Nothing could be more salutary at this stage than a little healthy contempt for a plethora of material blessings. Perhaps such a shift of values can be achieved by reappraising things unnatural, tame, and confined in terms of things natural, wild, and free. Aldo Leopold, Madison, Wisconsin, 4th March, 
1948. Lots of stuff there. I really agree with a lot of what he's saying. The land aesthetic and a wilderness aesthetic is something that he gets into in the later parts of the book. So I'm not going to really touch that right now. I'm definitely somewhat guilty of not having a healthy contempt for the plethora of material blessings that we have available to us. So I'm working on that. <laughs> I think that is something that I can probably take away is that, um, yeah, there are definitely some consumerist ideals that have been kind of nailed in over 24 years of living in this society. I, th I think there's definitely some things in here that I might feel a little defensive about in this book, but I think it is kind of important for me to read. Getting into the first essay of part one, A Sand County Almanac, the first essay is January, which is why I wanted to do this kind of as a monthly um, video series, is because the first part is, is split up by months, and I think it's really interesting to kind of look at each one individually and also it means that I have a lot of videos <laughs> to make until I kind of get used to this whole video making process. This first essay almost feels more of a narrative rather than like a non-fiction environmentalist essay. It's it's pretty fun. It has some really fun tone um, and really neat imagery. I think it's a good time. January thaw. Each year after the midwinter blizzards, there comes a night of thaw when the tinkle of dripping water is heard in the land. It brings strange stirrings, not only to creatures abed for the night, but to some who have been asleep for the winter. The hibernating skunk, curled up in his den, uncurls himself and ventures forth to prowl the wet world, dragging his belly in the snow. His track marks one of the earliest datable events in that cycle of beginnings and ceasing, which we call a year. The track is likely to display an indifference to mundane affairs uncommon at other seasons. It leads straight across country, as if the maker had hitched his wagon to a star and dropped the reins. I follow, curious to deduce his state of mind and appetite, and destination if any. The months of the year from January to June are a geometric progression in the abundance of distractions. In January, one may follow a skunk track, or search for bands on the chickadees, or see what young pines the deer have browsed, or what muskrat houses the mink have dug, with only an occasional and mild digression into other things. January observation can be almost as simple and peaceful as snow and almost as continuous as cold there is time not only to see who has done what but to speculate why a meadow mouse startled by my approach darts damply across the skunk track why is he abroad in daylight probably because he feels grieved about the thaw today his maze of secret tunnels laboriously chewed through the matted grass under the snow are tunnels no more but only paths exposed to public view and ridicule. Indeed, the thawing sun has mocked the basic premises of the microteen economic system. The mouse is a sober citizen who knows that grass grows in order that mice may store it as underground haystacks, and that snow falls in order that mice may build subways from stack to stack. Supply, demand, and transport all neatly organized. To the mouse, snow means freedom from want and fear. A rough-legged hawk comes sailing over the meadow head. Now he stops hovers like a kingfisher, and then drops like a feathered bomb into the marsh. He does not rise again, so I am sure he has caught, and is now eating, some worried mouse engineer who could not wait until night to inspect the damage to his well-ordered world. The rough leg has no opinion why grass grows, but he is well aware that snow melts in order that hawks may again catch mice. He came down out of the Arctic in the hope of thaws, for to him a thaw means freedom from want and fear. The skunk track enters the woods, and crosses a glade where the rabbits have packed down the snow with their tracks, and modeled it with pinkish urinations. Newly exposed oak seedlings have paid for the thaw with their newly barked stems. Tufts of rabbit fur bespeak the year's first battles among the amorous bucks. Further on, I find a bloody spot, encircled by a wide-sweeping arc of owl's wings. To this rabbit, the thaw brought freedom from want, but also a reckless abandonment of fear. The owl has reminded him that thoughts of spring are no substitute for caution. The skunk track leads on, showing no interest in possible food, and no concern over the rompings or retributions of his neighbors. I wonder what he has on his mind. What got him out of bed? Can one impute romantic motives to this corpulent fellow, dragging his ample belt line through the slush? Finally, the track enters the pile of driftwood and does not emerge. I hear the tinkle of dripping water among the logs, and I fancy the skunk hears it too. I turn homeward, still wondering. And that's January Thaw. I think it's a really interesting way to start the book. It's a far cry from the foreword that just preceded it. There's sort of an admonishment of our society writ large and how we interact with nature. And then this just kind of goes straight into like why you should care, I, I suppose. It doesn't really start with like an academic essay or anything like really trying to persuade the reader through facts and logic or anything. It, it really tries to get into the heart and the emotion of people by 
humanizing these animals in the place that he lives in the region that he lives these you know the mice the rough leg hawk the rabbit the skunk these are all like animals that are native to that part of the, the country so it's it's a really interesting way to sort of ease readers into the environmentalist lens of caring about the environment and the animals which is yeah it, it just feels very juxtaposed to like his closing remarks of the foreword where he was writing off the plethora of material blessings yeah i just think it's a really smart way to segue into the book well that's it for now. February also has a pretty short section, I'm, I believe. It's just one essay. So I'll probably bring in some other information as well for that month. The research I told you I wanted to do from the, the preface. And also some notes from my time in the class. Uh, there's some stuff in there about like other environmentalists of the time. Gifford Pinchot, John Muir, Henry David Thoreau. All like contemporaries of Aldo Leopold. I think Aldo started his career under Gifford Pinchot. Which, I, if I remember correctly... Their philosophies on conservation are wildly different, but I could be mixing up him and Muir at the moment. We'll see. I'll find those notes and I'll get back to you. And then, yeah, uh, look out for some more videos from me in the near future, hopefully. I'm going to try to get some other perspectives on this kind of topic as well, on the topic of conservation, um, instead of just from white guys from the 1940s. Definitely want to read some like indigenous books as well, uh, including like uh, Brain Sweetgrass. Um, I think this would probably pair nicely in terms of um, some of the, like, being part of the community of our world instead of kind of seeing humans as a separate entity unto itself. Yeah, I just think it would be an interesting thing to see the take of different people within this sector that come from wildly different backgrounds. And also there's going to be <laughs> reviews about more fluffy reading, like some pulpy westerns and sci-fi and stuff like that. So if you want to learn about bad books <laughs> i'll definitely let you know anyways yeah that's all for today take care of yourself take care of each other love you bye B -b bye bye